And when they came to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Listen to Reverend Andrew Taylor's Good Friday message. There they crucified him. There, where is the there? Outside the city of Jerusalem, which is the most religious city in the world. It is the only city on this planet Earth that is deemed to be of great religious importance and significance to the entire Christian community, to Judaism, and to Islam. There, of all places on the earth, in the most religious city in the world, Jesus Christ was crucified. It wasn't Rome, not Mecca, not Varanasi, not Babylon, not Gaia, not Constantinople or Istanbul, but Jerusalem, the most religious city in the world. Just what we would not expect. So there, they, second word, they. Who is the they who are responsible for his crucifixion? The most religious people in the world. The most religious people in the world. Not the intellectual Greeks in line from Socrates, Homer, and Plato. Not the iron-heeled Caesar-worshipping, all-conquering, empire-building Romans, but the most religious and privileged people in the world, the Jews. We know that it was physically conducted, executed by the Romans, but at the behest of the Jewish rulers. The most religious and privileged people in the world, the Jews. The people... The only people on this earth who had the laws of God given directly to them through the patriarchs and prophets. Not just common people, but the religious leaders among that group who proactively incited the mob to shout, crucify him. They, so they're the most religious city in the world. They the most religious people in the world. Third word, crucified. Crucifixion is the most shameful death in the world. Crucifixion, the most shameful death in the world. He was not stoned, not pushed off a cliff, not impaled with a spear, not hanged by a rope, not made to drink poison like Socrates, not burned at a stake, but he was crucified. Crucifixion. Deuteronomy 21 verse 23 says, Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus Christ was made a curse so that we could be made righteous. Talk about a divine exchange. Cursed is anyone that hangs on a tree. And this crucifixion on this cross was uh, preceded and prefaced by, first, him being beaten with rods, being punched, his beard was plucked, he was spat upon. This is by the Roman soldiers. They placed a purple robe on him, purple being a sign of royalty, in mockery, uh, trying to call him a king. They knelt down in mockery to him. And then when they punched him, they said, prophesy, tell us who hit you. And then they pressed a crown of thorns into his brow. You know, we know that on the cross of Calvary, the precious, incorruptible blood of Jesus Christ was shed for the cleansing of all our sin. But Isaiah 53, 5 also says, by his stripes, we are. Yes, healing is the children's bread. Imagine with me the cruelty. It is good we take time, not just once a year, more than that, but today especially, to, to try to imagine what Jesus went through. My late mother shared with me once that this one man of God earnestly, earnestly desired to have just a taste of what the Lord Jesus Christ went through in Gethsemane. 
And he kept persisting and asking the Lord, just give me a touch of what you had in Gethsemane. And my late mother said to me, he spent three months in a mental asylum. He came back to sanity for just a taste. Imagine the cruelty, the agony, the excruciating pain. They used, the Roman soldiers used what was called a cat of nine tails. That's a rod with at least nine extended leather flagella or thongs. And each leather thong was weighted alternately with weight, metal, pieces of metal and bone. And when that cat and nine tails curled around the hapless victim's body, it not only ripped off the skin and flesh, it cut through to the spine and ripped open even internal organs. The cat and nine tails, knotted leather thongs, curled around. It was a most effective flesh-cutting instrument. That is why the person had to be tied to a post or to a metal hook on a wall because they would have swooned in and out of consciousness and crumpled in a heap on the ground. So they had to be tethered so they could continue whipping the person while they swooned in and out of consciousness. It was cut to bleeding ribbons as was read at least once if not more this morning from Isaiah 9. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Just to put aside any facetious thinking in our minds, this is not just a little purple bruise when we bump our knee against a, a wooden table. It's not a little boo-boo on, on our child where we put a little band-aid. When the word of God says he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him and by his stripes we are <laughs> Isaiah 53 verse 2 says there is no beauty that we should desire him as a young church elder in this same city decades ago we had a debate Jesus was not good looking I was on the side of saying he was good looking and one of my friends said but the word says there's no beauty that we should desire him my friend you get cut to ribbons with a cat and nine tails. It shreds your body, probably curls across your face and pulls your eye out of your socket too. There'll be no beauty that we should desire you. Physiologically, after that shredding with a cat and nine tails, there was no beauty. It doesn't mean he wasn't a normal, good-looking man. And yet, Haggai calls him in verse chapter 2, verse 7, the desire. Of all nations. He was so emaciated. There was no beauty. That we should. Desire him. You know. There's no proof in scripture. That the Lord Jesus endured. 39 stripes. The apostle Paul says. He was given 40 save one. On more than one occasion. But for the Lord Jesus. It does not say 39 stripes. Just for clarification. We don't know how many stripes he bore. But 39 was at least the minimum for a criminal death penalty offender. In Jesus' case, some scholars think, and I'm not going to put too much stock in this, that all major diseases in the world can be put in 39 broad categories. Whether it's 39 or 139, it doesn't matter. But the word of God says, by his stripes we were healed. Whether it's arthritis, whether it's cancer, whether it's heart, no matter blood pressure, diabetes, it doesn't matter. By his stripes we are healed. Jesus paid the entire price paid in full, completely. Every disease. By the way, that wasn't a smooth, polished, planed down cross by a carpenter. It's a rough, hewn wood with splinters. With an already lacerated, opened up body. Bleeding Ribbons, putting this wooded, rough piece of wood with splinters, imagine it piercing further. No wonder the Lord Jesus collapses under the cross. And Simon of Cyrene 
is roped in to carry it for him. And then there's no let up. Now the rusty long spikes through hands and feet. He's nailed to the cross. Nails piercing through the nerves. The cross is then raised up and dropped with a thud into the hole in the ground prepared for it. He is bleeding profusely from his back, head, hands, feet. And the person literally eventually dies of asphyxiation or suffocation because they don't have the strength anymore to raise their body up to breathe. So when we think, he said, today you will be not so. Today. That's how Jesus would have spoken haltingly to the penitent thief, to John on the ground, even forgiving his enemies who reviled him while he was dying on the cross. He was reviled by the thieves, bystanders, religious leaders, yet he saves the penitent thief. He forgives the revilers, saying, Father, forgive them. And finally, his victory cry was, It is finished. That was not the cry of a vanquished foe, but a victorious conqueror. Father, Abba, Daddy, I have paid the price. It's finished. There's nothing more that needs to be done. I've paid. I've done all that you asked me to do. It's finished, Dad. How was the cry of a victorious conqueror? Christ Jesus on the cross, muted evil, defeated disease, crushed falsehood, choked treachery, conquered sin, and destroyed death. It is finished. And then, even after his death, whereas they break the legs of the two other thieves. The Roman centurion realizes that he is already dead. As the scripture prophesied, not a bone of his shall be broken, they pierced his side. I want to bring a little accuracy to a song we sang this morning. When I was a child, we used to sing it correct from scripture. See from his head, his hands, his feet, water and blood flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow? The Bible says every word of God is pure. That when Jesus' side was pierced by the, by the Roman soldier, that water and blood flowed from his side. I have read, and you can Google this, go to commentaries, that when a person dies under such duress, the pericardial sac around the heart accumulates with water. And when he's pierced, water and blood flow mingled down. Then it's appropriate to continue saying, did air such love and sorrow meet? That's, by the way, John chapter 19, verse 34 says, Water and blood flowed from his side. There, the most religious city in the world, Jerusalem. They, the most religious people in the world, the Jews, crucified or crucifixion, the most shameful death in the world. Him, him, the most Precious person in the world. The most precious person in the world. None of it makes sense at face value. It's the greatest contradiction, contravention of human justice. The most precious person in the world. The Lord Jesus Christ himself. Not just a prophet or a priest, or a king, but all three wrapped up in one. Messiah, Redeemer, Savior, Holy One, a prophet like Moses, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, the King of Israel and the Son of David. 
as Revelation 19.16 says, it's King of kings and Lord of lords. That at the name of Jesus, Philippians 2, 11, 12, 9, 10, 11, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Just a few closing thoughts. Yes, to us and the whole world. Salvation is free, but it was not cheap. Salvation is free, but it was not cheap. It came at a great and terrible price. The lifeblood of the precious Son of God, the broken body and shed blood of Jesus, the Son of God. Former U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft said, and I quote, and apply this in your life no matter what circumstance you and I are going through. For every crucifixion, a resurrection is waiting to follow. Sunday morning, we'll be talking on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For every crucifixion, a resurrection is waiting to follow. Very interesting that in the year 2004, that was when the movie The Passion was just released in the country of Qatar in the Middle East. This movie was touted as anti-Semitic by the generally anti-Christian Western media. Because it was touted as against the Jews, the Muslim rulers propag propagated the movie. And so many Muslims in Qatar went to see the movie and they were profoundly impacted by the movie, The Passion of Christ. Yes, there they crucified him. 1 Corinthians 2.8 says, Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. All I can say to you is this is a somber message. It is a somber day in our Christian calendar. But Sunday morning, put your running shoes on and come to church. For because for every crucifixion, a resurrection is waiting to follow. But it is good, it is fitting, it is appropriate that we focus on the suffering of Jesus Christ today. I want us to move to communion. I'd ask for the ushers to have the just come and distribute the communion while we move on to this next part of the of the service. I want to read from 1 Corinthians 10, just three verses. And this is the most intriguing scripture regarding communion. Not one that is too commonly used. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 15, 16, and 17. I speak as to wise men. Judge what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Here's what struck me years ago. Look at that verse, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 again. The cup of blessing which we Bless. And I ask the question, am I the one being blessed or doing the blessing when I receive communion? That seemed to be almost uh, like a juxtaposition or a contradiction. But the word says we are to bless the cup. Just like we, Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. We now bless this cup. 
Jesus paid the price, but we say, Father, allow me to share with you what I personally do when I take communion most often. We heard today, by his stripes, we are healed. And we know that it's his precious blood that cleanses us from all sin. Every time I take the bread, I say these words to myself, to my father. Lord, I thank you for your healing. Every time I take the bread, for my son, my wife, and myself, my family. For by your stripes, we are healed. And if you know any other loved one, somebody you care for, while you partake of the bread this morning, ask the Father for their complete and total healing. Inasmuch as many of us will be remembering Pastor Ashish also at this time. And of course, when I take the cup, and these are only symbolic elements, I then say, Lord, I thank you for cleansing me from every sin. And final thought on participation in communion. The word of God teaches us that each of us is to judge ourselves. It is not my place as a fellow believer or a minister to make a judgment on your life. But you, may, we do not want to eat and drink unworthily. And in case you say, oh, but I don't feel right now. Before you participate, say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. Cleanse me right now. And he instantly makes you worthy. But you must be sincere. So do not participate unworthily. We judge ourselves, not the other. So pray that prayer of repentance before we partake. And what you pray while you take it is fine. I simply felt to share in my heart what I do. There were four words we shared on today. There will be four V's we share on, on Easter Sunday. I'm sure you can figure out the last V. But there will be four V's we teach on, on Sunday Easter Sunday morning. So we look forward to that. But bring your running shoes on for Sunday. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you. We, we can't imagine what you went through to give your precious son, Jesus. But Lord Jesus, we remember your sacrifice again today in a very real way. Lord, even as we participate of this bread, which symbolizes your broken, bruised, and battered body. We pray and speak life and health and healing to, not to each one of our members and loved ones, Lord. Because we know that by your stripes we are healed. And as we partake of the cup, we ask you for complete cleansing from every sin. Your word says that if we walk in the light as you are in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses, continually cleanses us from all sin. We thank you for that cleansing from all sin. And so now we partake, Father, in Jesus' name. You may take the bread and the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. See from his head. His hands, his feet, water and blood. Water and blood flowing good down. Did air such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Just uh, bow our heads at this point for the benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. 
We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.